uh, today we're going to start the series of nursing care of nursing care of patients, which is going uh, in Kenyatta National Hospital. She's going to talk about many various aspects of uh, taking care of renal patients um, in various aspects as seen on the on the poster. Uh, join in. If you have any questions, please address them on the Q&A. Madam Wambe, Tafadali, take us away. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, Wambe, we can hear you. Uh, you can start. Oh. Yes, the floor start. is yours. Yeah. Oh, okay. let me share. You could uh, you could stop sharing so that I share my slide. Nancy, before you start, maybe I can. I can mention my co-moderator would be Stella Gizaiga uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, uh, participants. Is, uh, I'm grateful for this chance to be able to share the following slides about the nursing care of a renal patient. Uh, it's such a wide topic, uh, but I'll hope I'll do some justice within the next 40 minutes to just be able to get a nice overview of how to nurse uh, a, a renal patient or commonly known as a kidney patient. Uh, my name is Nancy Wangombe. Um, I have Bachelor of Science in Nursing, University of Nairobi, and also Master's in Organ Transplant from Barcelona, Spain, and I'm the Transplant Coordinator at the KNH. Those are the learning objectives that we should be able to know how to determine and estimate glomerular filtration rate. We evaluate, stage, and manage chronic kidney disease, understand the sec sequela associated with CKD and end stage renal disease, and basic conservative, peri conservative treatment, peritoneal hemodialysis, and kidney transplant concepts. Uh, let me begin with this slide of, uh, that gives some statistics about kidney disease. And before we start, I would want to also inform the participants that next week, Thursday, is our World Kidney Day. We normally celebrate, the whole world celebrate the World Kidney Day as a day dedicated to think of matters associated with kidney. And from World Kidney Day, these are the statistics that 10% of the population worldwide is affected by chronic kidney disease. The kidney disease can affect uh, people from all ages and half of the people age 75 or more have some degree of chronic kidney disease. One in every five men and one in every four women between the ages of 65 and, uh, and 74 have some form of chronic kidney disease. And, uh, it, it's also rated as the eighth leading cause of death globally. It's the 11th leading cause of the years lost due to ill health, disability, or early death. And the prevalence of C, uh, CKD is at 10.4 among women and 11.8 among, uh, among men and women consecutively. So we can see that more women are affected. And uh, it's acute kidney injury, mostly found in the patients who are acutely ill especially in critical care units, is around 13.3 million people each year and may resolve or may continue to become chronic kidney disease in future. And these are statistics from the International Society of Nephrology. Uh, let's just uh, separate these two, that we have acute and chronic uh, kidney failure. And by definition, in acute, it is sudden cessation of renal function, whereas in chronic, it's slow, irreversible. In, in, in etiology, eh, acute is normally brought about by some poisoning, some antibiotics, some infections, acute infections. 
Whereas us in diabetes, like uh, around uh, the COVID time, we found a lot of patients who are getting CKI from COVID-19 infection. But for chronic, it's any disease that is affecting vessels slowly but surely over a long time. Be it from diabetes, hypertension, or glomerular nephritis, any infection of the glomerular. The acute is normally often reversible if you retreat the posts. And for chronic, you may need to take the patient for dialysis or transplantation. Uh, let's just go uh, through the overview of uh, acute kidney injury. There are different causes of acute kidney injury. We have what we call prelino, any, any event that happens before the blood gets to the kidney, which could be cardiac failure where the, not enough blood is being pumped to the, uh, to the kidney for, for filtration, any sepsis that can cause inflammation of the kidney, tubules, uh, blood loss, like from accidents, from uh, the mothers who are delivering, dehydration, you know, you, you stay for a long time, maybe assume a patient who's been lost through a desert trying to walk around and it's hot and they're not drinking anything, they'll get acute kidney injury. Uh, and any vascular occlusion, any thrombus that can go and obstruct the arteries that takes the blood to the kidney. We have other causes that we can call the reno, anything that happens within the kidney. And these are the inflammation of the kidney. You can have poisons, drugs, toxins, uh, especially from snake bites, uh, from insects, very dangerous insects, or prolonged hypotension, uh, inflammation disease, all those things that happen inside the kidney can cause acute kidney injury post. The urine may be formed, but by the time it is it, uh, it's being transported from the kidney to the bladder for storage so that it can be eventually be eliminated. Uh, there are those things that can happen along the path and most of them are obstructions like the urinary calculi, the stones, uh, fibrosis, retroperitoneal, especially in women, benign prostatic, uh, prostatic hypertrophy, any enlargement, cancers, all those, any obstruction along the whole process of kidney, ureter, and blood can cause acute uh, kidney injury. Uh, for chronic kidney disease, we have top three causes of CKD in order of incidence, and diabetes leads the back, followed by hypertension and glomerular nephritis. Of importance is uh, glomerular nephritis is normally uh, common from throat infection, uh, from a, a bitter streptococcus, uh, uh, better streptococcus group A. That's why we always advise uh, uh, people to get treated of sore throat or any skin condition. They will bring about glomerular nephritis. And you can say that diabetes and hypertension can cause approximately 70% of the CKD causes. It is the major causes. We have other risk factors like congenital abnormalities, for example, polycystic kidney disease. This is a familial disease where you can get uh, a patient and their relatives, it's hereditary. They are getting some, some seeds in the kidney. They, they can enlarge and become so big and cause kidney failure. We have Alport syndrome, it's also congenital. And you, you get to know that, uh, especially in children, that they have Alport uh, syndrome when you find them having a kidney disease plus they have problem with hearing. Others are sickle cell disease. Urinary tract infection, and this one is very treatable. That's why we always encourage people to go for uh, treatment for minor UTIs. We also have people who just have family history of CKD book of no unknown cause. Stones, we are, we, uh, when they bring about obstruction, the one that we talked about, and a history of one time you suffered from acute kidney injury, it can progress to chronic kidney disease. And that is a diagram of showing uh, the causes of chronic kidney disease and the prevalence. Diabetes leads almost by 50%, it's 44. Uh, high blood pressure is at 29. Others, glomerular diseases and polycystic kidney disease. So uh, we, when, we, when we are talking about prevention and treatment of chronic kidney disease, we are normally, we are normally joined with diabetes because we are, we are in the same group of people. It's just that by the time they come to the kidney unit, they have been suffering from diabetes for so long that the effect has taken place. Uh, we've talked about urinary tract obstruction, anything that can bring an obstruction like the tumors. We have autoimmune diseases like scleroderma and SLE or systemic lupus erythromatosis. Nephrotoxic exposure from source, source, uh, sources such as over-the-counter medication, especially the aspirin, uh, brufen, 
some, some pain relievers that people buy over the counter. And we also have uh, pesticides. And I always tell uh, the community when you're talking, if you buy a, a pesticide or a herbicide and it has clear instructions that you need to put on gloves, you need to put on goggles, you need to put on a covering, that is what it, exactly what it means. Because what it, this one will lead to, uh, once they get to your hands or your eyes or wherever, it will be circulated by your blood. It will be taken to the kidney for cleaning. But while the kidney is trying to clean the pesticide or the herbicide or any poison, it gets damaged in the in the process. And that is how uh, those, those kind of pesticides and herbicides and poisons cause kidney disease. So it is always good to use those. You know, if they say you open the windows when you're spraying a particular poison or a herbicide, you wear these, do exactly that. And also we say that uh, being 60 years and older and being of African-American or American Indian Asian Pacific is a study that has shown that those people are also at a higher risk than normal of getting kidney disease. Now that you have kidney disease, how do you know that the you or the patient has kidney disease? We have, uh, we, we normally say that the kidney does not exist in isolation and that it is in the whole system of the body. All the systems will have some form of manifestation. Like uh, we begin with neurological, there will be lethargy, confusion, heart tremor, sleep disturbance, unusual behavior, and decreased mental sharpness. I remember when I was training many years ago in a medical training college, there was a patient who was brought to, a, uh, to, to, a, to the mental institution, like he had, he had he, you know, he had run mad, but on running all these tests, I, now I know because I, I remember he had frost, you know, like powder dropping from his face. It was just uh, high levels of uremia, and he was appearing like he had lost it. From the skin, the body is trying to get rid of all the waste you have in the body, and it ends up being stuck on the surfaces of the skin. So the skin will look uh, dull, like the normal, like people will be saying, this is not your color. Then there will be persistent itching, trying to come out, a rash and bruising, you know. There will be like, uh, if you're hit or you're pinched, it starts bleeding from the skin. From the reproductive, for the men, they will have electrical dispansion, uh, they will have decreased uh, libido even for female and pain during intercourse. Musculoskeletal, there will be joint pain when, they, when there will be that deposition of all the excess waste. There will be muscle twitching and cramping. Genital urinary tract system. Uh, the body is trying to sort itself also. There's so much poison in the body. What does it try to do? Vomiting so that it try to get rid of anything in the gastrointestinal system. Uh, to stop you further from feeding, there will be nausea. You will not feel like wanting to eat anything. And the first sign, once we begin treating the patient who have kidney disease, the first sign that they are getting well, they start now getting this appetite. They feel like eating because now the, 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 the way they were locked with these solids has been cleared. There will be pain in the abdomen because of gastritis, loss of appetite, we've said. And also, as the, especially in the AKI, there will be diarrhea that will be so smelly while the body is also trying to sort itself. And the changes in urine output. There might be uh, reduced urine output or cessation altogether. And uh, others, you'll, uh, especially the diabetics who've been diabetic for long, uh, the urine, instead of being the ember color, it will be clear like water, you know. We are just passing through it, but we are not removing the solids. The respiratory, there will be enough. Now, if the function of the kidney of removing the fluid is not taking place, uh, uh, fluid will be stuck all over everywhere. And the commonest places are the, uh, the lungs, and there will be shortness of, the, uh, of, uh, of breath, pain during coughing, and productive cough. And once it exceeds this, they start frothing, what we call pulmonary edema. Uh, and, and the uh, edema now will be everywhere, even from the feet, you know, that we normally say that it improves during the day. But as, it, however, the, the position that the patient was in, like if you sit for long, it will be the lower limbs, if they are lying on the back, it will be the sacral region, you know, from the face, it will be, be lying on one side of the face, one side of the face will look swollen. Uh, hematological and cardiovascular, they will be fatigued. They, they are just wondering how come I used to take these stairs and now I'm not taking these stairs. Uh, the clotting factor for the blood will be affected by the high urea, leading to nose bleeding. There will be feet and ankle swelling, headaches, feeling cold, dizziness, and weakness. 
uh, once uh, a diagnosis of kidney disease has been made uh, or there's some kidney involvement, kidneys don't feel the same from one patient to another. It's normally a whole, it's a whole, uh, ser it's a serialized way of failing. Like it will begin from stage one up to stage five. And after stage five, the term that is normally used from, uh, up now when you're stage five is chronic kidney disease or CKD, but after that it called end stage renal disease or ES, uh, ESRD, but nowadays the term uh, renal failure, end stage renal disease is being re replaced by end stage kidney, uh, kidney disease. They are with a K, so that we are communicating with our patients. Renal, they say, is very medical, so that our patients understand the, what we are talking about. We've used the, the, the word now ESKD, end stage kidney disease. It's good to note that we have the mild, moderate, and severe form of failure, and the treatments are different. What is also very discouraging or that makes it very complicated is by the time you are stage one, stage two, you may not know that you're suffering from kidney disease. And from this picture is when now during the World Kidney Day there, we will be having screening, free screening for the population. You can only know that you have some kidney involvement when you're in stage one or stage two through a screening. And a basic test like a urinalysis, if a patient is passing proteins, or uh, high blood pressure and diabetes, something like that. That's the only way you'll be able to, to know that you have some kidney involvement. But from stage three and, and stage three B, if you, are very, if you are very keen with yourself and you go for a medical exam, you can start getting some symptoms somewhere, like you are coughing more often than not. But the real uh, symptoms of CKD will be when you get to severe form and the glomerular filtration rate will be below 15. Uh, 15. The glomerular filtration rate is calculated using an EGFR calculator. You will need to have creatinine levels, the age, and the, and the, and the gender. And then it is the same way we calculate BMI. It will be able to give this. But the normal creatinines for female is between uh, 62 to 115, 120 there, depending on every institution. And for the men, it's between 53 to 100. So that anytime you get a creatinine that is above this, then you go and do the EGFR calculation. And stage three there about, around stage three, the creatinine will not even be so high, it will be around 130. But you see, it will, it will be already in stage three. Uh, of importance around these stages is, that, is, a, is, a, is what can be done at each stage. Like for example, if you, you, you notice that patient is in stage one, stage two, up to stage three A there, they are on drugs that are, that are metabolized by the kidney or drugs that normally makes the kidney function worse, they are stopped from those medications. If they have high blood pressure, high blood pressure is controlled better. If they're on diabetes, their diabetes is controlled better. Rehydrate them and also adjust their diet. You know, uh, with the uh, proteins being blamed for worsening the kidney function before the beginning of dialysis, they are, they are, they, they are put on a very minimal protein diet. But once the stage gets to below 15, stage five and above, we have to think about uh, renal replacement therapy. Uh, when we talk about screening, who should we screen? Like, does anybody who just walks around in a clinic? But there are those people who are, who, who are uh, what? Who are encouraged to be screened. Like people who have family history of CKD, it's good to have a test that urine, just a urine analysis a blood pressure monitoring and a BMI will be able to guide you. Uh, history of acute kidney injury some years ago, and we normally discharge our patients. The patients whose AKI has resolved, you discharge them on yearly clinics. People who are diabetes, yearly, we test their, their kidney function, hypertensives, people with acute kidney, uh, acute cardiovascular diseases, age or above 60 years, and certain uh, ethnic minorities, like the one we had talked about. And, and, and nowadays, you, you can either do a GFR or sometimes you just test for albumin. Why does protein pass or albumin pass when you have kidney disease? The glomeruli of the kidney has pores, minute pores. If the integrity is good and it is not affected by a kidney disease, it does not pass the big molecules like the proteins or the albumin. But if it is passing, that tells you there's something that has affected the glomeruli of the kidney, like there are pores already, there's some damage. And that is how now guides the treatment, the way the treatment will go. So how is it diagnosed, kidney disease? There's what we call a kidney biopsy. 
the patient is admitted like it's a one it, it's an inpatient uh, procedure uh, a biopsy needle is used through the back using an ultrasound machine and uh, and the and the and the and the needle is passed get a small fragment and is taken to the bio, taken to the laboratory histology lab others are the kidney functions like a uh, uh, urea, what we call blood urea ni nitrogen. References, these ones are by our laboratory here. The, it can be plus or minus in other laboratories. Creatinine, uh, this one is in, in milligrams, but it's liter, but we do it here in millimeters uh, per minimums per liter. You can check for uric acid, creatinine clearance, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. But it's good to note, uh, once these things are rising, the, what makes it emergency for a patient is the potassium. If the potassium rises beyond 4.5, because the work of potassium is contraction of the muscle, uh, our heart is also a muscle, so the first organ to be affected will be the heart. And this is one of the indications of when we begin dialysis. You have to, 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 to remove this creatinine and also bind the creatinine. So number one is, uh, is dialysis, number two is Diet, you stop the patient from ingesting further potassium and foods rich in potassium, uh, green leafy vegetables, anything that grows on the ground like uh, all the tubers, potatoes, arrows. And if they have to be ingested by the patient, they have to be boiled then the water forward. That is called blanching to reduce the potassium level. Such that for the whole life of the chronic kidney patient, we always watch, we, we always tailor our diet and information around potassium because that is what can cause sudden death, sudden cardiac arrest. The blood urea nitrogen, even if it is high, even if creatinine is high, uh, what it can cause more is uh, just feeling, patient feeling unwell, you know, but it, it, it rarely is it like threatening in itself unless it is beyond some levels. Another test that can be done uh, to test for kidney disease is a kidney ultrasound. Uh, where the length of the kidneys are taken, which is between, the length is between 9 and 14, and the, we always give a discrepancy of around 2 centimeters, with the length being 8 to 9 centimeters. When the patient has some form of uh, chronic dis kidney disease, we say that the length reduces to 8 centimeters and below. It's good to note why the doctors always request for a KUB, it gives the difference between AKI and CKD. If it's in CKD, the sizes are small, the kidney sizes will be small. But in AKI, the kidney is unwell, but chances are it is a reversible cause. That is why it is a very important uh, test to us. Kidney, ultrasound, and blood. Once that has happened, the kidney has failed, it's not working anymore. There are three, uh, three main, uh, there are four main therapies that can be used. We have what we call conservatives, supposing because eh, Kidney disease is very financially intensive. Like just to put a catheter and uh, start dialysis, it's nothing less than 20,000 in a government hospital. Forget the private uh, sector. Some people cannot even raise that kind of money. What do you do now? You put them on conservative treatment and we'll be seeing it in the next slide. Or another option is hemodialysis, which is now uh, being done all over the country where the patient goes to the hemodialysis machine Four, four hours, two times or three times in a week for the rest of their life. Because uh, if, the, if, if, if the function of the kidney of clean, cleaning and, uh, and regulating fluid is not taking place, you have to do it artificially. We have several dialysis units around the country. For in all the counties nowadays, you have dialysis and now other private, but at least every county has a dialysis unit by the government. We have a therapy, that, uh, a, third, a third therapy that has been in use but over time, it has been overtaken by hemodialysis because of some mathematics of economics. When NHIF covered hemodialysis, somehow it did cover peritoneal dialysis. And uh, these fluids are normally expensive. They imported from outside. And uh, that means the patient needed to cough some money from their pocket to be able to utilize it. So these peritoneal dialysis have, have been affected, has had very low numbers of patients, but mostly our children, like even in our pediatric department, uh, we have a pediatric department, they employ uh, peritoneal dialysis and it also has some very good outcome. In here, a catheter will be passed through the membrane, the peritoneal membrane, and the fluids will be passed every regularly, every four to, uh, four to six hours. 
you wait for diffusion osmosis to take place, then you drain out the fluid. And we call it continuous ambulatory because it's non-stop. You, you, you know, you can go home over lunch hour, infuse the fluid, go back to the office, go in the evening, so it's continuous. It can either be continuous like that or use a, a, a cycler. There are machines that you can use it in the night. When you are, when you are sleeping, it will be doing the exchanges. And during the day, you are free. However, all these treatments are just top-gap measures. Conservative, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. The ultimate treatment for kidney failure is getting another kidney from another person. And that is what we call kidney transplant. Uh, a patient will be given a third kidney around the right area fossa mostly, around where we, uh, the, the belt passes, and uh, it will replace the functions of the uh, failed kidneys. Uh, some, some of my photographs have disappeared, but what are the requirements for hemodialysis, especially for the people who will be taking care of the patients, transferring them to the dialysis unit? You will need a dialyzer, which are of different sizes, depending on different body sizes. Uh, that one is the artificial kidney. It looks like a tube. Blood will be passed through, and the processes of diffusion, osmosis, ultrafiltration will be taking place, and will be running for the next four hours or six hours, depending on the dialysis prescription. What will be drawing blood to the dialyzer will be bloodline. We have a set of bloodline that will draw blood to the dialyzer and return. And we have an acid concentrate and an acid bicarbonate, uh, bicarbonate cartilage together with ultra pure water. You'll always hear in your centers where you're working that once there is no water in a dialysis unit, there's no dialysis that can take place. How is that? If you see, we are calling them concentrate, meaning, uh, one patient requires around 120 mils of fluid to be cleaned. So we cannot import, because most of these things we import them, we don't manufacture. You cannot in, import 120 liters per person. So what they do, they bring the, 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 the fluids in concentrates of five liters and powders of uh, 9, 9, 50, 750 to 950 milligrams. Then there's dilution of one part into 34 to make a fluid, a dialysate fluid. That is what we'd be used to clean the patient through the whole time. How about conservative? If we choose the conservative route, the patient will require now the support using the patient decision aid. You know, we initiate the care planning, we engage pri uh, primary care uh, primary care givers, and especially the counselors, they normally come in very hardy in dialysis unit because uh, we say uh, kidney disease is a chronic ailment that patient need a lot of supporting how to adjust their lives, you know, sometimes they, they, they feel like uh, they did something wrong in their life. That is why they have this kidney, kidney disease and all that. So they can be taught how to improve their diet so that this, uh, the waste product is not accumulating as often to reduce their fluid intake, to treat uh, existing conditions like hypertension or diabetes. And then uh, they must be taught on a crisis management plan. What are they planning? Then we go straight talk about end of life plan, update all the conservative kidney management and care plan. And we normally say like we need that some form of like hospice type of care when you're talking about kidney disease. And in step four, we may start now counseling them on grief and loss. Uh, the nursing assessment of an eight stage renal disease patient includes the following, the fluid status. Uh, one main job of a kidney is uh, even if you took 200 mils of whatever or two liters, the, the work of the kidney is to remove what you don't need and stay with what it requires. But once that element is not there, you need now then to regulate the fluid intake. You, you, you need to watch what the patient has, uh, has, has removed that is what will give the guide for the following day uh, prescription of input. Uh, look at uh, the, how, how sometimes you are seeing the patient for the first time. You don't know whether is this patient normally this huge. You know, sometimes they can be so overloaded. I'm, I'm sure some of you have ever seen those patients. Like they have, they can add up to 20 liters because their kidney have been failing over some time and they, they had not noticed. When you look around, you'll see this tension of the neck veins, vital signs, the blood pressure, more often than not, it will be very high and they'll be having some labored breathing because even there, the, 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 the lung is affected. I, you assess the dietary pattern, what they're taking so that we reduce their, 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 their intake of fluid. And we normally say they will give them an allowance of one liter per day. And one liter is anything fluid. 
be it water, soup, water for taking medication, tea, everything, such that they, they are normally fed with like a quarter cup of tea, a quarter cup of water, until you can be able to establish how to be removing uh, fluid from this patient. So get it from the history of what they like, what they don't like, and help them exchange. Like instead of taking, if you like tea more, then don't take water, then you take tea, you know, that kind of uh, an adjustment. Uh, weight changes, ask them like, in the last three months, how, 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 how did you, how many kilograms did you weigh? Had you ever taken any laboratory values last, like let's say they said I was expected last year, I did my creatinine and urea, get those values so that you get the difference. Uh, understand the, or query the cause of dinophilia, its consequences and its treatment. Like uh, if it's a diabetic person, you are more likely to suspect is, uh, the cause will be that diabetes. As much as we have some conditions that we normally call acute or chronic, the kidney must, must, could have been failing, surely, but you know, over, but surely. But something then attacks, like maybe some medication, you know, some dehydration because of some GI problem. Then they get a, 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 an acute kidney injury. So we normally call it acute or chronic. That is why it is important to understand the cause of their renal failure. And you'll get it from all the history that you'll get from them. Uh, assess the patient's and family responses and reactions to illness and treatment. And more, more often than not, you need to reassure them that their treatment is something that can be done. And more importantly, assess for signs of hyperkalemia because that is what is life-threatening. The, the patient will just be talking there and then you just boom, drop. Because of potassium, anytime they start getting from five, five point something, that, that is what normally causes us to ask the patient to come for urgent dialysis. Uh, the priorities would be to maintain hemostasis. We prevent complications. And uh, the, uh, when we are talking about prevention, if the, if the fluid, for example, contain, uh, continues being high, chances are the patient will go into respiratory failure. They will need to an ICU admission. That's what we are talking about, complication. Uh, cardiac arrest, those are complications. So provide information about the disease process, prognosis, and treatment. Uh, here, they, 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 the patient might be having history already. I, uh, number one, we tell them that chronic kidney disease is a chronic illness. It will not go unless we do transplant. But they say, somebody, but somebody else in my village got this kidney disease and they got well. Now, it's good to give them information. They might, they are that uh, village mate or that person they are talking about could have been on acute kidney injury, not chronic kidney injuries. There's also a lot of myths around kidney disease. They'll be taken to herbalist, you know, they'll be taken to the prayer houses, all those ones. But what, what, what uh, is normally very uh, serious for the patient, what is normally very severe, if they take that line, is the herbalist root, because most of our herbs are made from roots, you know, they are boiled or leaves. Roots and leaves are, are high in potassium, and that is what normally will cause now the sudden death to this patient. Then there's prescription. More often than not, you'll find the patient has been given a whole five liters, and you are talking about reducing fluid intake. That is, uh, that is the part that you normally take a lot of information. You're telling somebody, all along you've told the person that it's good to take green leafy vegetables for your need of vitamins, but now again, you're telling them you're not supposed to take green leafy vegetables, you know, you're supposed to reduce. So that lifestyle adjustment and support normally takes a lot of time for, uh, for our kidney patient. Uh, for the diagnosis, uh, for you to come up with the diagnosis, it will be based on those assessments. Uh, and, the, and the example of those diagnoses, the nursing diagnosis that you normally come up with is that we'll be having excess fluid volume related to decreased urine output or dietary excesses and retention of sodium or water. We have imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements related to anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dietary restrictions, and altered oral mucous membranes. We have activity in Victoria, and these are patients who are not even moving out of their bed, you know. They're feeling sick already, the way we talked about the signs and symptoms of uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. And a function of the kidney that is also very important, uh, kidney does uh, regulatory of fluid, three main functions. Regulation of fluid, number two, removal of solids, number three, biochemistry. The kidney is involved in manufacturing of uh, red blood cells. That is why uh, for the people who work in medical wards, 
you will notice that we always require the patient to come for dialysis with some pints of blood. Because not that they bled, but there's, there's dysfunction. They normally have uh, iron deficiency anemia, and also we have destruction of the few remaining red blood cells by the ure uremia, you know, the high solutes in the body because destruction. And also the lifespan of the red blood cells is shortened, causing, thereby causing anemia. So anemia in itself will cause its own fatigue, forget even the kidney disease. The retention of the waste products and the dialysis procedure in itself. Uh, there's also this for situation low self-esteem related to dependency or role changes in body images. Like for example, uh, that therapy we've talked about called uh, peritoneal dialysis, it will mean we'll have a catheter with the patient around the abdomen, such that it will affect their sexual function. Others, they, they don't want to tell their girlfriends, their boyfriends that they have a catheter on their chest, you know, because they have to go, they, they have to go home with some form of a gadget that hangs around. So you need to to really help them come up with, with the body changes that have taken place and how to accept those changes. Uh, when you're talking about interventions, they should be directed towards the fluid status, such that for a kidney patient, a fluid input and an output chart is a requirement, is mandatory. You know, you should not have to nurse a patient who have, who is being uh, suspected to have kidney disease and you have no fluid input and output chart. And we, uh, and we normally say that if they are anuric, you, you, you don't exceed giving them around 300 mils, what is required by the money per day. 300 mils plus or minus uh, 50 mils, which is the insensible loss. And for the nutritional in intake, implement a dietary program to ensure proper nutrition intake within the limits of the treatment regimen. And once the patient, the, the nutritional requirement is different, if they are conservative, if they are on transplant, if they are on dialysis. But if they have not begun dialysis, you restrict their protein intake, especially from animal protein. But you give them a high caloric diet because the illness in, in itself is, called, is causing uh, increased catabolism. Teach them some form of independence, which promotes positive feelings by encouraging increased self-care and uh, uh, greater independence. Let them not have self-rule. Oh, that nowadays I'm unwell, so now I'll be sleeping around. Let them know that once you we will dialyze you within a day or two, if you are stable, it's good to get back to your places of work. Like we normally have even patients who make arrangements to be dialyzing at night. They have gone back to their economic models of, of working. You know, they're working with their teachers, their nurses, their, their, you know, they work in the bank and all that. Let them continue being independent. A protein, uh, Intake of high biologic value protein for the patients who are dialyzing, but not on the patients who are on uh, conservative. Medications, you should alter the medication so that they are not given immediately after meals so that they don't, you know, they don't feel, they, they, are, they are normally feeling nauseated. And more often than not, the doctors will have adjusted the type of medications, like all the medications are that are natural toxic, like even jatamycin, they are changed to others, like the penicillin. Then uh, uh, encourage them to alternate activity with the rest. Like they can walk around, but also continue uh, resting. And I think my time is finished. I've also, uh, I've also completed my presentation. It, 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 it's a big thing that should maybe should come in series. You know, like today we do peritoneal dialysis, tomorrow we do dialysis like that, but uh, at least we begin somewhere. And that is the overview of kidney disease and the different management. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nancy. That was quite an insightful uh, presentation. And uh, I like what you're recommending. This being the premiere of the, the nursing series webinars, I think we can always uh, incorporate some of the suggestions. Uh, straight to the Q&A, uh, let me read some of the questions that have come up. Uh, somebody has asked, what is the lifespan of a donated kidney? Let me read a few and then I'll hand it back to you so that you can be able to respond. Uh, that's lifespan of a donated kidney. Somebody else has asked, in case HIV positive client has elevated creatinine and normal GFR, what can you advise for this case? Um, someone else has asked, can peritoneal dialysis work for a patient who has abdominal scars? I think let's take those three first and then we can always go back and see how many more we can respond to. Over to you, Nancy. Uh, thank, you. 
Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for, for those questions. I begin by this photograph. I should have talked something small about this photograph. This one, as you can see, is an iceberg. On top, you can only see the top. You can't see the whole thing in the bottom. And that is what we normally say kidney disease is all about. A lot of kidney diseases are below here. We are just talking about the ones who are around on uh, dialysis. Uh, let's talk about the lifespan of a kidney disease, uh, of a kidney, of a donated kidney. It depends on the source. You can either have a kidney from a deceased donor, the patients who are just about, you know, who have some form of brain death, they're in ICU, or a living donor. A living donor is where me and my sister, we can walk to a unit and I donate the kidney to them. Their lifespans are different. The, 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 and also the match. How was the match by the time? How well were you genetically related to this person when you were giving the kidney? Uh, if, if it's a poor match and uh, not genetically related around 10 years, with the new medications, we are getting anything between 25, 20, uh, between 15 to 25 years. So on average, we say that a new kidney, a donated kidney can, on average, take 10 years. About the HIV, uh, let me also say that creatinine is not the, is not the only marker for a kidney disease. That is, you don't make diagnosis of kidney disease using, you think creatinine alone, because we have other causes of high creatinine. Other causes of high creatinine are uh, when you are when you, are, you 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 get some muscle wasting. You know, creatinine is a is a product of muscles. So if a patient is losing weight, you know, maybe with the diagnosis of HIV, not eating well, you know, all those problems, they are losing their weight randomly, such that you will find their creatinine is high. That is why, independently as a marker, you never use creatinine as a as, as a sign of, uh, of, of, of kidney disease. The other reason, even children who are diarrheaing, they are losing weight also, you find they have high creatinine, even if their kidney is not, is not uh, affected. And uh, they say the best test for kidney is called an inuline test. So the, 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 the patient should continue being followed closely. Uh, there are medications adjusted just in case there is a, a, a medication that, is, that, is, that, that has a problem with the kidney, just like the TB treatment, but uh, the, uh, that, that is that. Keratinine alone is not uh, a sign of kidney disease. Peritoneal dialysis, yes, we have indications and contraindications for each therapy, even hemodialysis. We have indications for hemodialysis, contraindications. Peritoneal dialysis, the same. Kidney transplant, the same. It's not everybody who is transplantable. Of the peritoneal dialysis, patients who have uh, abdominal surgeries, those ones are not good candidates for peritoneal dialysis because the integrity of the peritoneum must be there. Uh, sometimes they, they, there's communication. You know, they have all those hernias there and they bring a uh, complication for the doing the exchanges. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping I've answered their questions. Stella, we continue. Yes, I think you have answered. Uh, I'll take a couple of more questions. Uh, somebody has asked, um, is AKI a risk factor for CKD later in life? And um, someone else has asked about nutrition, but I'm thinking that was covered. Um, Somebody else has asked uh, what predisposes more women than men to kidney disease. I think we'll take those two and then we can, yeah. Back to you, Nancy. Uh, acute kidney injury, yes. is a, In fact, I was trying to get that slide, is a risk factor in itself. We say it for, for somebody to get chronic kidney disease, at one point of their life, they, uh, they are at a higher risk than normal. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here it is. We had said that uh, they have other risk factors of chronic kidney disease and a history of acute kidney injury. Uh, because maybe the kidney, uh, the kidney was affected more, it just recovered, but the process again for moving into CKD has restarted. So acute kidney injury in itself is a risk factor and the patient who have recovered from AKNI needs to be followed in a clinic, for the yearly clinics for the rest of their life. Some of them may not develop uh, kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease, others may, but it is a risk factor, not a cause. Uh, nutrition, we have said we have dealt with nutrition. Sorry, the, the, the other question, Stella? The question was, why, what predisposes more women than men to kidney disease? Oh, uh, you saw the, the you saw the, I, I had displayed the risk factors for, 
for, for chronic kidney disease, UTI is one of them. And even from uh, physiology, women have shorter what, shorter urethras, so they, they are predisposed more to UTIs and almost like that the UTI will cause the kidney disease. There are other lifestyle, lifestyle things, like women, they will put on all the makeups, all the mafuta, you know, some skincare products have been blamed for forming chronic kidney disease because whatever you put on your skin, the body will try to clean it off. So it will take it to the kidney, as I had said, of the pesticide, and that way it will cause, uh, by, the, by the virtue of the body trying to clean it, it will get affected, and that is another cause. Another third reason that women get more is uh, because of uh, cramps, menstrual cramps, small pains like that. They're always on some form of uh, painkillers. When a woman, they just like kuvumilia, and women will take painkillers, brufen, and all that. So that is what has shown, uh, those are the studies that are being worked on to see why they are more predisposed uh, to, to chronic kidney disease than the rest. However, of the people who are living with kidney disease, the, the women also because of the, of the health-seeking behavior, more women are alive than men, because maybe we go to hospital early, men don't go to hospital early, you know, there are all those differences. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. I'm seeing a lot of questions that uh, probably people who joined in later when the webinar was already in session. Uh, for those who would like to 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 have the webinar, it it we normally upload them on our YouTube. Uh, on YouTube, so you can access even this webinar there. Um, I'm seeing if there's a question, we can take one last one. Um, about protein diet, I think that one is to do with, uh, it is advisable that any patient who is suffering from a chronic illness should definitely have a nutrition as part of the management team. So I think that one is answered and I think Nancy covered that. Um, Somebody is asking, are we practicing CKM in KNH? Um, CKM? Nancy? CKM. CKM? CKM? Yes, CKM. Meaning? I have no idea. Let's just leave that. So anyway, uh, thank you once again, Nancy, for that very, very, very educative uh, presentation. I'm sure we shall plan to have you again because I'm seeing the attendance is quite remarkable, meaning that people are very interested on matters kidney. Uh, you have educated us. I've also learned something. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for participating. And uh, this is, like we said, this is the first of many other series to come of nursing series webinars. And uh, we're excited to have you on board. And we encourage that, uh, that even next time when you attend, kindly invite a friend, uh, ask as many questions in the Q&A session. Those who are not able to join us from the beginning, you can be able to access this webinar on our YouTube and even on uh, our website, the KNH website. Otherwise, thank you so much. And uh, I think we can call it a day. You're free to leave, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah.